Hello everyone from California. I hope you're having a great week. Here the research is good and the weather is just awesome, so I'm definitely having a great week. So uh, let's start with the videos for this week's uh, pre-class material. So the first thing we'll do in this video is study the derivative of trigonometric functions. So now it's a good time to uh, take a break. If you don't remember uh, a lot about trig functions, well you can go up and review your notes from high school. You can go in the textbook, I think it's appendix D. Let me check to make sure. Yes, Appendix D in the textbook has uh, everything you want to know about trig functions. All right, so what we're going to start is try to find the derivative of the sine function, and then from there we'll go on and, and calculate derivatives of all trig functions. So let's first thing before we start calculating. So let's try to guess what the derivative of the sine function is. Well, first I can just draw what the sine function looks like. It's something like that, right? I guess we all remember what it looks like. And it looks pretty much like that. Now we know that the derivative should calculate the slope of the tangent line, so we can check and see what it should look like. So for example at 0, well this slope should be 1, here it will be 0, here it will be 0, here it will be minus 1, minus 1, and so on. So if I project here, I get 0, 0, 1, minus 1, minus 1, and it keeps going like that. So if I draw this function, Here's what I'm going to get, something like this. Now, what is this function? Well, if you recall your trig function, this looks very much like a cosine function. So just from the graph, you can guess that the derivative of the sine function should be the cosine function. So now that's what we want to prove. So we'll prove that this is correct using the definition of derivative. All right, so let's get started. So we take our function to be the sine function. Now we know that f prime of x, by definition, should be the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. And now we can replace what our function is, which is the sine function. So we get limit as h goes to 0 of sine of x plus h minus sine of x divided by h. Now there's something that is called the addition formula for a sine function or for trig functions in general. So you can look back at the appendix D in the textbook if you don't remember it. But there's a property that says that the sine of the sum of two angle is equal to the following sine of x cos of h plus sine of h cos of x. Right, so the, that's exactly what we're going to use. So if you don't remember that, that's a good time to go and review the trig properties. So we can use that and substitute that in uh, our equation here to replace the sine of x plus h. So what we'll get is that the, we get the limit as h goes to 0. Oh, I changed color. Cool. Uh, is equal to sine of x cos of h plus sine of h cos of x minus sine of x divided by h. And what I'll do now is just rearrange this expression to be able to evaluate the limit. Right. So how can I do that? Well, the first thing I can do is split, it, split this expression in two. So, okay, well, how do I want to do that? Well, I'll bring the last term, the sine of x term, with the first term, which also has a sine of x. And I'll factor out the sine of x. So I get sine of x times cos of h. That's the first term. And then the last term will give me minus 1 over h. Right, so this is the first term and the third term in the line above. And now I still have my other expression. So I can distribute the limit here. You know the limit of a sum is the sum of the limits. And then I get sine of h over h times cosine of x. All right, and then the next step is to uh, use the fact that the limit of a product is the product of the limits, as long as the limits are finite, in this case, all the limits are finite, so I can use this property. I get the limit as h goes to 0 of sine of x times the limit as h goes to 0 of cosine of h minus 1 divided by h plus limit as h goes to 0 of sine of h over h times the limit as h goes to 0 of cosine of x. All right, so that looks pretty complicated, but it's actually pretty easy to evaluate. At least part of it is easy to evaluate. First, what is this equal to? 
Well, sine of x here, I'm taking the limit as h goes to 0 of sine of x. So there's no h dependence whatsoever here. In fact, x is considered constant here because I'm taking a limit with respect to h and not x. So the limit here is really just the limit of a constant, which is a constant. So this is equal to sine of x. And similarly, the limit here of cos of x as h goes to 0 is just cos of x because it does not depend on h at all. And now I have two crazy looking limits. Now we've seen those before. So we saw on week three, I think I told you, I gave you a challenge, which is to prove that the limit as h goes to 0 sine of h over h is actually equal to 1. So I told you you should use a squeeze theorem to prove that. Now I know many of you probably haven't tried it, but if you look back at the uh, in-class activity slides for week three, you'll see a proof of that. And there's also a proof in the textbook in section uh, 3.3. So you can look at that if you want to know how to prove that this is actually equal to 1. Because if you were just naive and plugging in h equals to 0, this would be a 0 over 0 case, right? So it's not so obvious what this limit is equal to. Now similarly, this one I didn't prove in the note, but the proof is very similar to the other one, and it's also done in the textbook. So the limit of cos of h minus 1 over h is actually equal to 0. All right. So now that we know that, we can uh, calculate things. So the first term here is 0 times sine of x, so it's just 0. Second term gives me 1 times cosine of x. So I do indeed get that the derivative of the sine function is equal to the cosine function. Great. Now it's very important that you, this is a very good example of how to calculate a derivative using the definition of derivative. So you have to be familiar with that. So uh, make sure you understand very well how this calculation goes. And it's also important that you're able to use the limit here of trig functions, such as the limit of uh, sine h over h as h goes to zero. These kind of limits you have to know and be able to use them in different contexts. All right, so that's good. So we've proved that the derivative of the sine function is equal to cosine. In fact, you can prove in a very, very similar way. I'm not going to do it because the proof is just exactly the same, but it's a good exercise to do it yourself. You can prove that the derivative of the cosine function is not quite the sine function, but minus the sine function. The minus sign here is extremely important. It's easy to forget it, so don't forget it. If you don't remember it, you can always draw the picture for the cosine function. Look at the slope of the tangent line, and you'll see that what you get is minus the sine function and not the sine function. All right, now out of these two uh, derivatives, so the derivative of the sine and the cosine, then you can calculate the derivative of all other trig functions. So you don't have to remember the other ones if you don't remember them. You can always calculate them back. All you have to use is the quotient rule. So let me give you the example of the tan function, but we can do the same thing for all the other trig functions. So how can I calculate the derivative of the tan function? Well, I could do it from the definition, but since I don't like to use the definition, I'm going to try to do it in a faster way. So what I can do is write the tan function as sine over cosine. That's the definition of the tan function. And now you see that this is just a quotient of two functions. So you've seen last week that whenever we're taking a derivative of a quotient, we can use the quotient rule. What does it tell us? Quotient rule, remember, is low d high minus high d low. Draw the line and square below. So what is this? This is low, which is cosine, d high, d dx sine of x, minus high sine of x, d low, draw the line, and square below, so that gives me cosine square of x. By the way, we can write, this is just notation, you can write cosine square like this, or cosine of x square, these mean the exact same thing. However, if I write cosine of x squared, this is different. This means the cosine of x squared. Right? This would be the same as cosine of x squared. So you have to be careful whenever you use the function to use the, use the square to put the square in the right places here. All right, so let's go back to our calculation. So now I can sum in the results that I know. So okay, I have cosine here. The derivative of sine is also equal to cosine, so I get this for the first term. Second term, I get my sine, and the derivative of cosine is minus sine, don't forget the sine, this over cosine square. Now, what is this? Well, I can just multiply the things upstairs. I get cosine square. The sine here become a plus sine, so plus sine square over cosine square, 
And now I use the trig identity, which says that the sine square plus cos square is equal to 1. So I get 1 over cosine square for the derivative of tan, which also uh, is equal to secant square, because the definition of secant, if you remember, is just 1 over cosine. All right, so we've just proved that the definition, uh, the derivative of the tan function is secant square. Now you could, as, as I said, it's a good exercise to try to do it from the definition if you want, but you could do it just by from the knowledge of the derivative of sine and cosine. Okay, so to end this video, let me just uh, tell you what the derivative of the other trig functions are. So we've seen the first three. Now you can also calculate the derivative of the cosecant function is minus cosecant cotangent. Derivative of secant is secant times tangent, and the derivative of cotangent is minus cosecant squared. Now, uh, you don't necessarily have to remember all of those by heart. What you do need to know for sure is the first two. These are super, super important. I recommend that you know all of them by heart, or they will become... Uh, you will know them anyway if you do the exercises, because we use them all the time. The point is that the four last ones you can always recover from the first two using the quotient rule. So if you don't remember them, you can always recover them, but it will take you a while. So in an exam, that's probably not the most efficient way to go. So uh, it's a good, uh, I think it's a good advice to just know all of them by heart. Now, uh, you should also know that you can use uh, these derivatives in conjunction with the other rules that we've seen last week. So the product rule, quotient rule, and so on. So there's some good exercises in the book of that, and we'll do plenty of those uh, during uh, next week.